Hello and welcome to the 15th installment of my Pokemon Generation 3 ROM hacking series. The focus of this tutorial is to learn how to initiate each type of trainer battle. To do this, we'll be utilizing a tool called Advanced Trainer created by Hackmew, a retired member of the ROM hacking community. This video will be broken down into the following segments. How do I navigate Advanced Trainer? What are the different types of trainer battles? And how do I properly initiate each of these trainer battles? Following these segments will be an application demonstration. In this final part, we will be creating a custom rematchable trainer battle script. We're going to be assigning a trainer battle script to the NPC highlighted in advance map. Before we can do this, we need to actually craft the trainer along with his specific team of Pokemon. Open advanced trainer, then load your ROM. A lot of options and properties are used here, so we'll traverse through them one by one. The trainer selection box allows us to scroll through a list of every available trainer slot in the game. These values range from 001 through 2E6, giving us a ton of space for creating custom trainers. Selecting a trainer will display its trainer data, which consists of most of the screen. The trainer's ID number is how we will identify and refer to them in our scripts. We can edit the trainer's name in the name box. The trainer's sex is distinguished to the right of the name. We can use the edit control under the sprite section to change the trainer's battle sprite. The intro music is a song that plays as soon as the trainer sees the player from afar. You can figure out which value represents which song by scrolling through the different types of already existing trainers and noting what type of trainer they are. The unknown value represents the trainer's intelligence level. This box probably doesn't work like you might think. An intelligence of 4 does not mean the trainer is necessarily better than if the same trainer had an intelligence of level 3. I will post a link in the description of this video to what each of the different values represent, but I'll also go over a few important ones verbally. A value of 0 basically means that the trainer will spam attacking moves and has no knowledge of types or damage calculations. A value of 1 will have a basic understanding of damage calculations. A value of 2 understands things like type advantages and disadvantages, and a value of 7 has the knowledge of all of the previously mentioned battle concepts. Using the box at the top right of the window, we can import, export, erase, or even randomize a trainer. These options may be useful to those who are transferring certain trainers from one ROM to another. The Trainer Class Multi-Choice box allows us to scroll through every type of trainer in the game. We can change the name of a trainer class by editing it in the white box below the multi-choice box. The money rate box changes the amount of cash earned when this trainer is defeated. You can see the actual amount of cash earned underneath the unknown box labeled prize money. The amount of prize money earned varies depending on what the trainer's class is. For example, an Elite Four member will give more cash than a regular trainer even if they both carry the exact same money rate. The final area in this tab is the trainer's held items. Leaving an item slot blank indicates no held item. Remember that when choosing an item, a trainer will not use things like revives or ethers. Clicking the reload button will reset any changes you've made to this particular trainer. Clicking the save button will save all the changes made to the trainer data. Clicking on the Pokemon data button brings us to an entirely new tab which is devoted solely to the trainer's Pokemon. The Pokemon amount section shows us how many Pokemon this trainer has and we can scroll through to edit or view each Pokemon. If you want to add or remove a Pokemon to the party, hit the up or down arrows underneath the Pokemon amount label. If you add a Pokemon, you'll have to repoint some data. You can do this by hitting the repoint button. Make sure to change the fill byte box to FF instead of 00, then copy and paste the suggested offset into the new offset box. If you don't trust the program's free space finder, open your ROM in a hex editing program, look for the specific amount of free bytes, and use that offset. Click the OK button and the trainer's data will be repointed successfully. We can check the dual battle button if we want this trainer to fight us with two Pokemon at the same time. We can change a Pokemon in the trainer's party using the species multi-choice box, its level, its held item, and its AI value. The AI value must be between 0 and 255, from dumbest to smartest. We can specify whether or not we want to give this Pokemon custom attacks and or items using the items slash attacks multi-choice box. If you choose to give the Pokemon custom attacks, you can edit them at the bottom of the window. That was a lot of stuff. I'm not going to show you the trainers I build for the trainer battle examples since I've already burned a lot of time showing off advanced trainer. The only thing I want you to know is that I'll always be using the trainer slot 001 for this tutorial's sake. 
Let's move on to scripting a trainer battle. For this script, the player will speak to an NPC who will then battle the player. Very straightforward and simple. After lock and face player, type trainer battle. This command has a varying amount of parameters based upon which kind of battle it is. The first parameter denotes the battle type, meaning either a regular battle, extended battle, rematch battle, etc. This is the parameter that we're going to be focusing the most on. The second parameter is the trainer ID value displayed in advanced trainer. The third parameter can be left as 0x0. The last two parameters are pointers to the text that is displayed before the battle is initiated and the text that is displayed during the battle sequence but after the player has defeated the trainer. I filled out the command. I chose a battle type of 0x0 because this is the most basic form of a battle. It means that the script will not continue after the battle is finished. After the trainer battle command, you'll need to make the NPC say some dialogue. This is because if we talk to the NPC once again after we have already defeated him, something needs to happen. In this case, the trainer battle will be skipped since the trainer was previously defeated and the message box command will execute, then the script will end. Viewing the result, we first speak to the NPC. The intro text is then displayed and the battle commences. After we defeat the trainer, he says the outro text, then the script terminates. If we speak to this NPC once more, he'll say some dialogue, then the script will end. What if we want the NPC to be able to spot the player from afar? To do this, open advanced map and click on the NPC. The view radius value tells us how many tiles away the NPC can detect the player. You need to be careful here. Take note of the NPC's movement type. If your view radius is too high, the NPC will be able to spot the player through a wall and walk through the wall to start a battle. Use the grid view if you need help determining how many tiles away you can afford to allow your NPC to detect. You'll also have to check the trainer box or the NPC will not be able to spot the player from afar. Do not use the lock and face player commands if you decide to make your NPC have a view radius. Just start the script with pound org at start, then the trainer battle command. Let's change the battle type to 0x1, instead of 0x0. Notice that a type 0x1 battle requires an additional pointer parameter which I've named at continue. This 0x1 value will allow the script to continue execution even after the player has won. The script will continue starting at this new pointer section. I wrote an extra dialogue message in this extended portion, then ended the script. Be aware that we still need the message box command directly after the trainer battle command since we can still interact with the NPC after defeating him. Checking it out in game, everything looks the same as before up until the player defeats the trainer. After the battle sequence ends, the NPC continues his script and says some dialogue. If we speak to him again, he'll use the message that we wrote directly after the trainer battle command. Battle types 0x0 and 0x1 are really the only ones most hackers ever use. Others do exist, but they're very rare to see. On screen is a chart of every battle type and what they require. You can pause the video and scan over this chart if you're interested. There are three more battle commands I want to discuss. The check trainer flag command will check if the specified trainer ID, noted in advanced trainer, has already been defeated. If so, the variable last result will store a value of 0x1. Next are the set trainer flag and clear trainer flag commands. If a trainer has not yet been defeated, its trainer flag will be set. In other words, if a trainer's flag is set, we can still battle the trainer. If we clear that trainer's flag, a battle is no longer possible. We can use this idea to create rematchable trainers. Shown on screen is an example of these three commands working together. All of the setting and clearing work is done by the trainer battle command itself, so normally you don't have to worry about this stuff. That's everything I plan to discuss in this tutorial. Using the information we've learned, we will create an event in which the player is able to battle a trainer, reset the trainer's flag, then battle the trainer once more. After a second battle, the player will no longer be able to get a rematch. Trainer battles are one of the most immersive scripting events. When you play a hack, the thing I'd say most people remember are the battles, specifically any big boss battles. I really like to customize my own trainers as it gives me a sense of control of the flow of the game. Being able to create big epic battles and balance everything in a way that suits the intended difficulty of your hack feels great. The only thing I feel like I have to warn you about is what a lot of hackers mistakenly call difficulty. If you're trying to make a difficult hack, refrain as much as possible from just upping the opponent's levels drastically. 
There's much more to battling that can make the game more difficult for the player, such as different AI values, held items, and team diversity. Remember that making things too unfair for the player will make your hack not fun, and no one wants to play a not fun or unfair game. Also, don't create a boss battle that just spams double team. I'm looking at you, Destin Jigold. But I still have fond memories of Ruby Destiny Life of Guardians, so thanks for that, and I'm looking forward to the next one. We're about at the end of creating this script. Everything that went into making this has been taught to you through this tutorial. Hopefully you all learned something valuable from this, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask either over at Poke Community or right here in my video's comment section. Thank you so much for being my audience, and I'll be back in the 16th installment of this series.